so this is the second part of chapter seven. Um, this is our last chapter seven video, and this will cover chapter 7.2 through chapter 7.6. Um, so we're basically going to cover the reactions in cellular respiration, which include glycolysis, the oxidation of pyruvate, um, the citric acid cycle, um, and oxidative phosphorylation and chemiosmosis, and then we'll talk about anaerobic respiration and fermentation and general kind of biosynthetic pathways as well. So for each of the reactions in cellular respiration and also fermentation, there's a lot going on and it's easy to get lost. So for these reactions, it's important to focus on the reactants, so what's going in, the products, what's going out, um, the location, and how much ATP is produced or used in these reactions. So the first reaction in cellular respiration is called glycolysis. This happens within the cytoplasm of the cell. Remember the cytoplasm is basically the liquid portion of the cell. So we're saying this happens um, generally inside of the cell um, with enzymes, but not in a particular organelle. And um, again, we're going to focus on glucose in these reactions to sort of simplify things. Um, so we'll say glucose, which is a six carbon molecule, is a reactant. Also, we've got NAD, which is a coenzyme, and this requires ATP to work as well. So we will end up producing two pyruvate, which are three carbon molecules, two NADH, which are reduced coenzymes, and we'll get a net gain of two ATP per molecule of glucose that goes through glycolysis. Um, glycolysis can be divided into the energy investment phase and the energy payoff phase. So with glycolysis, I want you again to focus on the big picture of reactants and products and ATP use. Um, but if you're interested in more detail, these next couple slides will give you that. So in the first part, the energy investment phase of glycolysis, um, basically we take glucose and um, we spend two ATP. So two ATP are hydrolyzed and we stick a phosphate group on the either end of the glucose and we get fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Um, and then that six carbon molecule is broken into two three carbon molecules, which are called glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. Um, from there, in the energy payoff phase, um, the two glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate molecules are broken down into two pyruvate molecules, which are three carbon molecules, um, and we also produce two NADH and four ATP. So um, we spent two ATP to get it going, um, and we produce four at the end. So where does glycolysis occur? Glycolysis occurs in the cytoplasm of the cell. And then does glycolysis require oxygen? No, glycolysis does not require oxygen. Um, oxygen is not a reactant in glycolysis. And then what is the name of the three carbon molecule at the end of glycolysis? Technically, you have two of them. So the two three carbon molecules at the end of glycolysis are called pyruvate or pyruvic acid. So what happens with that pyruvate that we produced in glycolysis? Well, it depends what kind of organism you are, and it also depends if oxygen is available. So if oxygen is available, we'll go on to the oxidation of pyruvate, we'll go on to the citric acid cycle or Krebs cycle, um, and then we'll go on to the electron transport chain or oxidative phosphorylation. Um, basically, the cell will continue with aerobic cell cellular respiration. Um, aero means air basically and in this case um, the air we're talking about is oxygen so if oxygen is available we will do aerobic cellular respiration if oxygen is not available um, if the cell can it will switch to fermentation um, unless it's capable of anaerobic cellular respiration um, what's the root word and mean so not or without, right? So anaerobic cellular respiration is um, cellular respiration without air, which really, in this case, the air is talking about um, oxygen, so O2. So we're gonna pretend like we have oxygen available. So if oxygen is available, we go on to pyruvate oxidation or the PrEP reaction. This happens in the mitochondrial matrix, which is the liquid portion of the mitochondria. And this requires 
the 2-pyruvate, which we produced in glycolysis, and then 2-NAD, which again, NAD is a coenzyme, so it's an electron carrier. And this produces 2-acetylcoenzyme A, which are two carbon molecules, um, and 2-carbon dioxide, and um, we reduce that NAD into NADH, and so we get 2-NADH as well. So you can see from the image, we've got pyruvic acid going in, acetylcoenzyme A going out, and also we produce NADH, which we will use later. Um, this is one of the areas where we produce the carbon dioxide that we need to ultimately breathe out. So here's just another picture showing you the same sort of thing. We've got pyruvate, which are um, two three carbon molecules that we got at the end of glycolysis, and then that goes into the mitochondria, into the liquid portion, um, so the matrix of the mitochondria, and um, in pyruvate oxidation, again, we get acetylcoenzyme A, carbon dioxide, and NADH. Um, that brings us to the citric acid cycle, which is sometimes called the Krebs cycle. Um, this happens in the matrix. Remember again that the matrix is a liquid portion of the mitochondria. And the reactants here are the acetylcoenzyme A we produced in the previous reaction. Um, also NAD and FAD, which again are coenzymes, so they're going to serve as electron carriers. So then we get um, carbon dioxide, ATP, and NADH and FADH2. NADH and FADH2 are just the, the reduced coenzymes. So when NAD picks up electrons, it becomes NADH. When FAD picks up electrons, it becomes FADH2. So the citric acid cycle, we do finally get some more ATP, um, but still we're, we're not really getting all that much ATP. But the citric acid cycle helps set us up for the next step. So a little bit more background on the citric acid cycle. It's a metabolic cycle. Really, it's like eight steps, which are each catalyzed by a specific enzyme. And it's called the citric acid cycle because in the first step, um, the acetyl is removed from the acetyl coenzyme A and attached to oxaloacetate to form citrate or citric acid. So that's how it gets the name citric acid cycle. Um, and then the next seven steps are going to break the citrate back down to oxaloacetate, making the process um, a cycle. Um, and the NADH and the FADH that are produced are going to move electrons from um, ultimately your food or organic molecules to the electron transport chain in the last step of cellular respiration. Don't memorize this picture or panic on me when you see this, um, but I just want to let you see um, there's a whole bunch of different organic molecules there, and there's enzymes that are facilitating the reactions along the way, um, and basically what we're doing is taking an organic acid and ripping off the carbon dioxide and electrons and sticking those electrons onto our coenzymes NAD and FAD and getting NADH and FADH2. Um, and also we're producing carbon dioxide and some ATP as well. Um, maybe if you get into biochemistry, you will get to memorize all of the intermediates there. But for now, focus on the big picture of the citric acid cycle. Um, so which two reactions in cellular respiration occur in the mitochondrial matrix? My dog is answering for you in the background. So again, the mitochondrial matrix is the liquid portion of the mitochondria. So that's going to be the citric acid cycle and also um, the oxidation of pyruvate or pyruvate oxidation or the prep step. And then how many ATP are produced in the citric acid cycle? You get two ATP in the citric acid cycle. So that brings us to the final stage of cellular respiration, which is called oxidative phosphorylation and chemiosmosis. Um, it's, it's kind of a mouthful, but it's a good name. We've got oxidation by the electron transport chain. Again, remember that oxidation is loss of electrons. And then we've got phosphorylation by something called ATP synthase. Remember again that phosphorylation is adding a phosphate group to a molecule. Um, and then we've got chemiosmosis, which is the movement of ions across a semipermeable membrane um, down an electrochemical gradient. So this happens on the cristae, so that inner membrane of the mitochondria. Um, and 
if this is an aerobic organism like ourselves, we will use oxygen here. We'll also use those reduced coenzymes we've produced, so the 2-NADH that were made in glycolysis, the 2-NADH that were made in the oxidation of pyruvate or the prep reaction, and um, the 6-NADH and 2-FADH2 that were made in the citric acid cycle or the Krebs cycle. Um, and the products will be water and also uh, about 26 to 28 ATP um, per molecule of glucose. And then we'll still have the NAD and FAD. We've just taken the electrons and hydrogens off of them. So those can be used later as well. So when we talk about an electron transport chain, basically um, the electrons in our electron transport chain in this case are coming from NADH or FADH2. And the transport chain is a series of protein complexes um, in the inner mitochondrial membrane, and they accept and donate electrons in a series of redox reactions. Remember, a redox reaction is just talking about gaining and losing electrons. So these molecules embedded in the inner mitochondrial membrane are passing electrons along. Um, the electrons drop in free energy along the chain, so they go from higher energy to lower free energy along the way. Um, and this transfer of electrons can be used to pump hydrogens um, from a low concentration to a high concentration across that membrane. Um, and so we get an even bigger difference or an even larger concentration gradient between the two sides of the membrane. Um, and then oxygen is used in the electron transport chain as a final electron acceptor. And when oxygen binds to hydrogen ions or protons, we've got H, O, H, so we end up getting water. Um, so that's where we produce water in cellular respiration. And then a really kind of neat thing about that is that even reduces the hydrogen ion concentration on that side of the membrane even more. Um, so we're really setting up this pretty big um, concentration gradient of hydrogen ions or protons. And so then these protons are going to um, provide energy for the next step, which is actually when we synthesize the ATP. So the phosphorylation portion of this happens um, with a protein called ATP synthase. Um, ATP synthase um, allows protons or hydrogen ions to cross it, and the hydrogen ions can't cross the membrane on their own. They have to go through ATP synthase. Um, and so as they go through ATP synthase, ATP synthase acts like a water wheel or a wind turbine. Um, it's this rotary complex that spins as the protons go through, and that provides the energy to um, attach the phosphate group to the ADP. So we have added adenosine diphosphate, or ADP, which has two phosphate groups, and then we add a phosphate group to it, and we get adenosine triphosphate, or ATP. Um, I will post a video for you um, on our Canvas page. Um, I like this video that I'm going to post for you because it actually shows the ATP complex spinning, which I think is worth taking a look at. So here's just another image of um, the electron transport chain, and um, this is showing you there's a proton concentration gradient or a hydrogen ion concentration gradient, and it's trying to show you the electrons being transported um, along those purple blobs. Those are supposed to be the protein complexes, and it shows you the production of water um, when the hydrogen ions bind to the oxygen, um, and it also shows you the production of ATP as the protons make it across ATP synthase. Um, this picture it doesn't do as good of a job showing you ATP synthase though because it doesn't look like any kind of spinny rotor complex whatsoever. So if we look at this picture again, um, this picture really describes everything that happens in cellular respiration, right? We've got glycolysis, we've got pyruvate oxidation, we've got the citric acid cycle, and you've got oxidative phosphorylation or the electron transport and chemiosmosis. Um, so this picture is a great thing to review. It's showing you, you know, glucose goes into glycolysis, you get two pyruvate out, you get a net gain of two ATP, and you get two NADH, which then makes its way 
um, all the way to the last step. Um, the pyruvate goes to the next step, pyruvate oxidation. It's showing you that's happening inside the mitochondrion. Um, in pyruvate oxidation, you get 2-acetyl-coenzyme A. You also get 2-NADH, which again will make its way to um, the last step, oxidative phosphorylation in the electron transport chain. If we track what happens with the acetyl-coenzyme A, they've got it going into the citric acid cycle, showing us that we make more ATP there as well, and we also make an ADH, an FADH2, which goes into oxidative phosphorylation. Um, and then we make a whole boat ton of ATP there, like 26 to 28 ATP. Um, so we get a grand total of about 30 or 32 ATP. So as far as ATP goes, um, in cellular respiration, you've maybe heard before that you get more ATP than that. And if you're in a class that tells you a higher number and you have to take that test, go ahead and record that higher number for that test. Um, the reason our book gives us a lower estimate is because it's trying to take into account the transport of ADP into an ATP out of the mitochondrion. Um, that takes energy as well. So we really get about 34% of the energy in a glucose molecule transferred to ATP. Um, and most of the energy flows in the following sequence, from glucose to NADH, um, to the electron transport chain, um, to that protein proton or hydrogen ion mode of force, and then ultimately to ATP. So you can count this or keep track of it, um, right? Glycolysis, we make two ATP. Well, we have a net gain of two ATP, right? Because we spent two to make four. So the take home paycheck of ATP there is two. Um, the NADH gives us three to five ATP. Pyruvate oxidation, the NADH there gives us five ATP. Um, citric acid cycle, um, you know, we get two ATP or GTP, which is really about the same as ATP for our purposes in this course. So you get two ATP there. The 6NADH um, gives us 15 ATP and the 2FADH2 gives us 3 ATP. So that gives us that total of 30 to 32 ATP. Overall, um, I'm not worried that you know that 2-NADH and glycolysis gives you 3 to 5 ATP. Um, I want you to know you get a net gain of 2 ATP from glycolysis, you get a net gain of 2 ATP from the citric acid cycle, and then the rest of the ATP are actually produced um, in the last step, so the electron transport chain and oxidative phosphorylation. So where is the electron transport chain located? The electron transport chain in this case is located in the inner mitochondrial membrane or the cristae of the mitochondria. Um, number seven, which step of cellular respiration produces the most ATP? So we produce the most ATP um, in that last step, so oxidative phosphorylation and chemiosmosis, or if you just said the electron transport chain, I would take that as well. Um, and then which step of cellular respiration produces the most carbon dioxide? That one is tricky and often forgotten, but that would be the citric acid cycle, or maybe you called it the Krebs cycle. Either way is fine. Um, and then number nine, which step of cellular respiration produces water? Um, really, we'll focus on the water that's produced um, in the last step, so the electron transport chain or um, oxidative phosphorylation and chemiosmosis. So if a cell lacks oxygen, it still needs ATP to stay alive. Um, and sometimes environments can lack oxygen and there's organisms that are adapted to live in those environments. Um, or organisms can become deficient in oxygen in like a particular area. As far as what could cause um, an oxygen deficit in an organism, um, something like sprinting or heavy use of a particular muscle set can cause those muscles to use up the available oxygen and their oxygen stores. Um, and if they still need to keep going, they'll only be able to go for a short period of time because they'll have to rely on a different method of ATP production. Um, but basically, if an organism is suffering an oxygen deficit or an environmental lack of oxygen, there's kind of two strategies, if you will. Um, they can use a substance other than oxygen as the final electron acceptor um, in the electron transport chain. And if that's the case, they're doing anaerobic respiration. Um, remember, an means not or without. So this is respiration 
without oxygen. Um, or they could produce ATP only by way of substrate level phosphorylation, and then that would be fermentation. So which strategy the organism uses is going to depend on what kind of organism they are exactly. But we'll talk about these two different kind of strategies, if you will. So anaerobic respiration um, still involves glycolysis, the citric acid cycle, and oxidative phosphorylation, and chemiosmosis, or the electron transport chain. Um, however, they use a final electron acceptor that is not oxygen. And what that electron acceptor is, is going to be species dependent. For example, E. coli uses nitrate under anaerobic conditions um, and um, Disulfa vibro vulgaris uses sulfate. Um, so it depends on what kind of organism you are. Um, and humans cannot do true anaerobic cellular respiration. So that brings us to fermentation. Um, in fermentation, this produces two ATP per glucose molecule when oxygen is not available, which compared to cellular respiration, um, either anaerobic or aerobic, um, that's not very good because cellular respiration yields about 32 ATP. However, you would do fermentation if that's your only option because at least you get two ATP. So in this case, pyruvate is going to be reduced to lactic acid or ethanol, which again is species dependent. Um, and the benefit of fermentation is that it can give you some ATP when oxygen is not available and that it will at least get you by. Um, however, the products can be toxic to the cells. And again, we're not making that much ATP. Um, two is way less than 32. Um, so here's just a couple pictures of fermentation in action. Um, in humans, we can do fermentation. You could probably think of beer or wine or yeast when you think of fermentation, but technically the process that we use um, where we end up making lactate um, is fermentation. And then again, more likely you're thinking of um, yeast and ethanol fermentation when you think of fermentation. Um, but that's not the only thing that pyruvic acid can become. Um, many organisms use fermentation and there's many tasty products that are made um, because of fer fermentation. I don't expect you to memorize these, but our book just tells you that you produce carbon dioxide and ethanol or lactate or lactic acid. And that's not entirely true. It depends on what kind of critter you are, what happens in fermentation. So as far as comparing fermentation and respiration go, both are going to oxidize pyruvate and glycolysis um, with a net gain of 2 ATP there. Remember in glycolysis, you actually produce 4 ATP, but you gotta spend ATP to make ATP, so you take home two. Um, and they also um, reduce NAD to NADH. However, what happens with the NADH is going to be where this whole thing is different. Um, so in fermentation, the final electron acceptor is an organic molecule like pyruvate or acetaldehyde. So we would make um, ethanol, lactate, or other fermentation products there. Um, in cellular respiration, it's going to transfer electrons from NADH to a carrier molecule in the electron transport chain and go on to make a whole boat ton of ATP. Um, so fermentation only makes two ATP, cellular respiration wakes, makes way more ATP. So obviously we don't eat just glucose, right? We're not just eating spoonfuls of glucose. Um, that would not be very healthy. Um, and so really this has been sort of a simplification, although I'm sure it doesn't feel anything like a simplification at all. Um, but we just looked at glucose, even though it is possible to eat other things other than glucose and get energy from other organic molecules. So glycolysis really accepts a wide range of carbohydrates. Um, if we're talking about proteins, proteins have to be digested to amino acids and then the amino groups have to be removed from those amino acids before they can feed into glycolysis or the citric acid cycle. Um, fats are going to be digested to glycerol, which can be used in glycolysis and fatty acids. Um, fatty acids are then broken down by something called beta oxidation, um, which helps us get acetylcoenzyme A. And then acetylcoenzyme A can feed into the citric acid cycle. Um, and really an oxidized gram of fat produces more than twice as much ATP as an oxidized gram of carbohydrate.
so remember that we have kind of inner convertible pools here. So um, if we look at proteins, we can break proteins down into amino acids. They can feed into glycolysis and this, um, the oxidation on pyruvate and the citric acid cycle. Fats can feed into glycolysis and um, pyruvate oxidation and carbohydrates can feed in pretty easily into glycolysis as well. Um, so again, if you have to take a biochemistry course, you'll probably go into this in a lot more detail or a metabolism course. Um, but just think big picture wise here, we use more than just glucose, but for now we're focusing on what happens with glucose. So really the body's going to use small molecules to build other substances, and some of these small molecules come directly from food and others can be produced during glycolysis or the citric acid cycle. Um, so we can, you know, break proteins into amino acids and then we can link amino acids back together to produce proteins and kind of so on and so forth there. So let's review. Um, this first one is kind of tricky. Um, in a disorder called pyruvate dehydrogenase complex disorder or PDCD, the enzyme responsible for converting pyruvate to acetyl coenzyme A is inhibited. Which of the following would you expect to happen? Um, I recommend you pause it here and think of the answer. All right, so if the enzyme that goes from pyruvate to acetyl coenzyme A is inhibited, we're not making acetyl coenzyme A. So I think it's a good idea to, you know, kind of start off and look at our options there and see which ones we're going to knock off right away. So A says acetyl coenzyme A levels are going to decrease. So A is still in the running. Um, B says the acetyl coenzyme A levels would decrease. So B is still in the running. Um, C says pyruvate, acetyl coenzyme A, and lactate levels would increase. So that means C has got to be out of the running. Um, and then D says pyruvate, acetyl coenzyme A, and lactate levels would all decrease. Um, so D still potentially in the running. All right, so we talked about acetyl coenzyme A levels. Um, if we're going from pyruvate to acetyl coenzyme A and that's inhibited, we're not going to be getting rid of pyruvate. So pyruvate levels are going to be going up. So if we look at pyruvate going up, um, A says pyruvate goes up. So A will not eliminate yet. Um, B says pyruvate levels go up. So let's not eliminate B yet. We already eliminated C. If we go to D, D says everything goes down. So now we've eliminated D. So now we're stuck between A and B. If we look at that, um, A says pyruvate levels go up, acetyl coenzyme A and lactate levels would go down, and B says pyruvate levels and lactate levels would go up and acetyl coenzyme would go down. Um, how do we get lactate? So we get lactate in fermentation. Um, and as far as on the exam goes, I think this would be, I think the first two, pyruvate levels and acetyl-CoA, I think you could predict that. But knowing lactate levels, I think would be trickier. Um, but we get lactate levels with fermentation. And if you can't go on to the rest of the electron transport chain, um, this is where you're going to get stuck. So um, the answer for this one is going to be B. Pyruvate and lactate levels are going to increase because we're going to be taking some of that pyruvate and making lactate, and acetyl coenzyme A levels would go down because we can't make acetyl coenzyme A um, because the enzyme required for that is inhibited. So that one's kind of a tricky one, but 11 is B. Um, 12, does fermentation require oxygen? You're correct, hopefully. Fermentation does not require oxygen. Um, and then 13, is anaerobic respiration the same as fermentation? No, they are not the same. Fermentation makes two ATP. Anaerobic respiration is the same as aerobic respiration as far as ATP production goes. Um, the only difference between aerobic respiration and anaerobic respiration, or the big difference really, is that they use a different final electron acceptor. Um, so 
anaerobic respiration and fermentation both don't require oxygen, but the ATP production and the mechanism is different. So that was the end of chapter seven. Um, so again, we talked about glycolysis, oxidation of pyruvate, the citric acid cycle, which is also called the Krebs cycle and the TCA cycle. Um, we talked about oxidative phosphorylation and chemiosmosis, which is sometimes also just called the electron transport chain or even the ETC. And we talked about anaerobic cellular respiration. I know it can be frustrating that, you know, some of these reactions have three different names, um, but the reason I tell you the different names for the different reactions is so that if you are watching a video or run into them in a different class, you'll know that this is the same thing that you've already learned about before. Um, so for each of those reactions, again, focus on reactants, so what's going in, products, or what's coming out, where they happen, and how much ATP um, you take home from the reactions.